Hello and welcome to part three in my nagging thoughts series on is remarriage adultery? Before I get into it this week, I want to take a brief moment and ask you to please like, subscribe, share, and above all, please do comment. I think it is extremely edifying for us to be able to hear the types of arguments that we are making to justify our theological conclusions. Are we appealing to scripture or are we appealing to tradition? Are we attacking people personally or are we attacking people's arguments? That said, uh, I do want to just give a brief recap of what I have exegeted in quite some detail in uh, both uh, episode one and two of this series in case anybody is just joining me for the first time now. In episode one, I made a positive case from the original Greek found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 27 and 28 that all those who've been released from marriage whether divorced or widowed, do not sin if they marry. I also appealed to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, to make the case that prohibiting marriage is a demonic teaching that comes through people whose consciences have been seared with hypocrisy. I made that same argument in episode two of this series where I extended my positive case to appeal to the original Greek found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, that the unmarried, whether virgins or divorcees, and widows do better to marry rather than to carry a torch for someone. This is particularly true given Jesus's testimony that not everyone has even been given a capacity or a gifting from God to live as a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And you can see that in Matthew chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. This is something Paul reaffirms right here in this chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 7. I also appealed directly to the Greek to show the outline for this chapter, at least for the verses that we've covered so far, stating that verse 1 is bringing up the issue of celibacy and that verses 2 through 6 are addressing that within the context between husband and wife and that verses 7 through 9 are dealing with it for those outside the context of marriage, which brings us to our verses today. We're returning to addressing married people, and this time we're addressing the issue of adultery. And here is what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11 says in the New English translation. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife should not divorce a husband, but if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband should not divorce his wife. Those who believe that remarriage is adultery often get that idea right from these particular verses. And on the surface, it does appear that at least in English, and especially in the New English translation, which is my preferred translation, that this is indeed the correct interpretation of these verses. However, if we do our due diligence to honor 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, to test the spirits of all teachings, by comparing them not to the words of Bible teachers or Bible commentators or even Bible translators, but to the original words, the inspired words of the Bible, we will see that this is in fact an eisegesis that is imposing tradition onto the precise word of God. I thank God that we live in the information age so that any lay person does not have to become a Greek scholar in order to independently honor 1 John 4, 1 or 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 to examine all things and to test the spirits uh, without too much effort so that we are not in a position to place blind trust into people that claim authority in Christ's name. No matter what your Christian theology is, the Bible says that there is not one human apart from Jesus Christ who does not sin. And in Romans it says, no, not one. So we all have an obligation not to take each other's words for God's. So let's get into it. What does God's word actually say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11? It actually says nothing about divorce 
even though it appears twice in the New English Translation version of these verses. The Greek word for divorce is apostasion, and it is not in either verse. I am providing links for everything for you in the description so you can fact check me on everything, even if I completely butcher the pronunciation on any of the Greek. Verse 10 contains the Greek word karizo, which means to vacate, or uh, it's the idea of physically pulling away or abandoning. Verse 11 uh, contains the Greek word aphiemi, which means to physically send away or let go. Both words are referencing a physical separation and not a legal divorce. So let's hear these verses again in English with those concepts properly represented. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife should not physically abandon a husband, but if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband should not physically send away his wife. Now, denying or ignoring the nuanced precision in God's word on the distinction between a legal divorce that is every bit as legally binding as a marriage is and a physical separation is one of the favorite eisegesis that this remarriage is adultery camp loves to appeal to. The other favorite eisegesis has to do with the word betrothal which I will address in another nagging thought. But let me spend some time today refuting the objections that one fleshers have to hold fast to suppressing the truth of the vocabulary that is intentionally articulated uh, in God's word concerning the word divorce. Some will argue that the authors of the Bible wrote words that mean physically separate when they really meant legal divorce because the two concepts are completely interchangeable. But this is only true if a physical separation can only occur after a legal divorce has already taken place. Now, some may argue that this is always the case because that's precisely how God sequenced it when he put divorce in his law in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 which I will address again in another nagging thought. But if someone were to physically separate without a legal divorce, then the two words are in no way interchangeable. Spouses have never been considered to be legally divorced simply because they are physically separated. If that were so, just going to work uh, apart from a family business would be considered divorce. That's the level of legalistic absurdity that one can go to uh, by practicing this logic of taking words and running with them out of the context of the whole counsel of the word of God. So the question is, is it fair to assume that all physical separations occur after a legal divorce, at least at the time of Jesus when he was teaching on this matter? And the answer is a resounding no. The Romans, who had uh, political control over Israel, had a practice of divorcing without a legal certificate. And in fact, the Romans did not make divorce a legal matter until nearly half a millennia after Jesus in 449 AD. Roman men customarily divorced their wives simply by consulting friends uh, or those that might be impacted by his decision. This Roman custom was not a legal formal procedure. It's a mas maiorium, which means it's a Roman custom. And it was documented by Valerius as early as 307 BC. So this kind of mas maiorium or Roman custom divorce and remarriage was very common and quite rampant among Roman elites who often use marriage to form new social, political, or economic alliances. Nonetheless, we have a strong biblical example of a physical separation that was completely absent any kind of divorce, be it legal or according to any Roman custom. Mark chapter 6 verses 17 and 18 as well as Matthew chapter 14 verses 3 and 4 document how the Roman king of Judea, Herod Antipas, had unlawfully taken his brother's wife. 
The only reason the Bible says that John the Baptist objected to the marriage between Herod and Herodias as unlawful is specifically because Herodias was still Philip's wife. So it's important to consider that Herod Antipas was also previously married. Yet John the Baptist never objected to Herod's marriage to Herodias because he was Phasaelus's husband. And I apologize if I'm butchering her name, but that was Herod's first wife's name. John the Baptist clearly recognized that Herod was, in fact, divorced from his first wife. So he never brought up that issue. But the fact that Herodias is always referred to as Herod's brother's wife is a clear attestation that she was never divorced from her first husband, Philip. John the Baptist never referred to Herodias as a divorced woman or Philip's ex-wife or Philip's first wife. John the Baptist also never objected to Herodias being married to a polygamist. He never said it's not lawful for Herodias to have Phasaelus's husband. So either John the Baptist was totally sexist in a way that, that he did not hold women accountable for the exact same behavior considered wrong when conducted by a man, or he wasn't preaching remarriage after divorce is adultery. He was preaching remarriage while still married is adultery. What I've just articulated from the Bible is sufficient to make my case, but uh, what I'm saying is actually confirmed by the first century historian Flavius Josephus, who documented that a condition for this marriage was that Herod Antipas was required to divorce his first wife. Again, I'm going to provide links for you in the description so you can verify this for yourself. Herodias agreed to marriage and habitation with Herod Antipas, but there was no agreement that she divorce her husband. Not surprisingly, this historian documents that this eventually ended up causing war in which the emperor Tiberius took Herod's side against the father of Herod's first wife, Phasaelus. Now this is evidence that the emperor of Rome saw nothing wrong with Herod divorcing his first wife because it was in accordance with Roman custom. However, Herod lost that battle because the Roman soldiers who came from Herodias' first husband's territory actually defected and helped the enemy win. And uh, this is evidence that the common Roman soldier saw something clearly wrong with Herod marrying Philip's wife because it was not in accordance with Roman custom. And these people ran a little fast and free, hence the expression, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Divorce and remarriage was common in the Roman world, especially among Romans with power who were looking to make alliances with other rulers. So it's nothing to risk losing your standing in society with uh, as a soldier. Uh, to take a stand on such an issue. But Roman law did require that a marriage is only valid to, uh, to one person at a time. So again, divorce and remarriage by both Herod and Herodias isn't what made their union unlawful to the point that it caused wars. It was her lack of divorce from her first husband that was. From a Bible believer's perspective, the case that John the Baptist made is interesting because Leviticus chapter 18, verse 16, as well as chapter 20, verse 21, specifically say that having sex with your brother's wife is a sin. Now, in the past, I have argued that John the Baptist was arguing against incest with King Herod here. But Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 6 commands that a brother must, in fact, marry his brother's widow in order to have a child with her to carry on the family name. So legal incest really uh, cannot be the biblical issue concerning the relations between a brother and sister-in-law. Adultery is. But if the variety of adultery John the Baptist was preaching against wasn't because Herodias was still married to Philip, but because each of their first spouses uh, were, were not dead yet, uh, that's actually a problem that is very easily remedied by a king with the power to order executions, assassinations, and wage wars 
as we witnessed when it came to the beheading of John the Baptist, as well as the historical wars that this unlawful Roman marriage caused. But just for fun, let's assume that John the Baptist was arguing that it wasn't lawful for Herod to have his brother's wife because remarriage is adultery. That actually uh, wouldn't carry any authority with Roman elites who were even more casual about divorce and remarriage than the school of Hillel or the rabbi Akiva famously were. They would have laughed in his face as a zealous lunatic. The fact that John's accusation that marriage wasn't lawful struck such a nerve with these powerful, loose moral Romans to the point that Matthew 14, 5 says that Herod wanted to kill a man that Mark 6, 20 says he was in awe of as a righteous man, just as much as Mark 6, 19 says that Herodias wanted to kill him, is further evidence that Herodias was not divorced mas maiorium or according to Roman custom from her first husband, Philip. In other words, Herodias was physically separated from her husband, but not legally divorced. So no, a physical separation that does not involve a legal divorce is not uh, an interchangeable uh, concept or the physical separation and legal divorce. They're not interchangeable when you don't have the divorce piece of it. And in fact, many people have lost their lives over this very important distinction, at least with the case of King Herod. This nuanced difference between a physical separation, be it by sending a spouse away or by leaving on your own and getting a legal divorce is involved in every case that concerns divorce in the Bible, which I will address with each verse independently on a different nagging thought. But anyone can verify this information by looking up the original Greek words the authors of the Bible specifically chose to precisely articulate themselves on their own. For a free resource, I recommend BibleHub.com where you can type in any word, like the word divorce, to find all the relevant verses that contain that word. Now from there, you can click on a verse and then click on the INT, which is at the top of the page, to access an interlinear Bible in order to see the original Greek. Now from there, you can click on a number um, that appears above the word in order to access the definitions, word studies, and concordances for that word. So you can see how this same word is used elsewhere in the Bible. Now I hope that information is helpful to you. And unless anyone wants me to address any more issues related to the topic of remarriage, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 38, then what I will do next nagging thought is I will address 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39 next. I look forward to seeing you guys next week for that. And I want to thank you again for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you have a great week. God bless.